My name is Susan Wingrove Reed, and I'm the pianist and the education consultant for the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra. And boy, is it good to be back together again, uh, making music and putting on some events. So speaking of which, after missing a year of a much loved event on the Anchorage Symphony schedule, we are back. The Mark of Zorro, Spider-Man Move Over. This was the world's first action adventure movie and it premiered on November 27th, 1920. It's rich with humor and impressive athleticism and justice for all. Douglas Fairbanks, the star, plays a dual role as Don Diego Vega and Senor Zorro. All of the action is human driven. There are no special effects enhancements or stuntmen involved. So everything you see is exactly as humans created it. The film was based on a pulp story that came out in a magazine in 1919 called The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston McCulley, who used the time period of the Spanish missions, which was between 1769 and 1821, where 21 different missions were built in California that were exactly 30 miles apart from each other so that someone could travel on horseback and go to the next mission in one day. So here we have the cunning Zorro. And Zorro, by the way, is the Spanish word for fox. Don Diego is the son of a rich landowner and um, he deters suspicions of his fight for justice by playing a lazy fool. His alter ego is Zorro, who's um, the personality he uses to keep two steps ahead of the bad guys. Well, the plot goes this way. There's a corrupt governor named Alvarado who is crushing the poor people of the Spanish California under his iron heel. And the wealthy fop Don Diego Vega sheds his silks, dons a mask and a cape, grabs a sword, and becomes the legendary Zorro, defender of the people. Infuriated by Zorro's meddling, Alvarado dispatches his right-hand man, Captain Ramon, who has a score to settle with Zorro for also stealing away the object of his own desires, the lovely Lolita. In reviews of this film, when it came out, and then from historical perspectives, I put together a summary. It, this film slowly sets the stage and effectively builds the tension and anger of Don Diego as he shifts from merely lurking in the shadows to save the innocent to inspiring a movement to take down an evil governor. It's exciting, thrilling, romantic and thoroughly entertaining. And it's all anchored by a rousing performance from Douglas Fairbanks. This is what going to the movies should be about, pure escapism. Senor Zorro, Mr. Fox, he's a Robin Hood-like rogue who scars the faces of evildoers with his mark with his sword, the Z. When not in the disguise of Zorro, He's a dueling and rescuing guy. And Don Diego, the fool part of his personality, courts the lovely Lolita, Lolita and with bad magic tricks and worse manners. She can't stand Don Diego and says, he's not a man, he's a fish. She is also courted by Captain Ramon and by the dashing Zorro. So she thinks she has three suitors. She really likes Zorro, by the way. Now, think um, Superman and Batman as we talk through a couple of the next ideas. In the end, when her family is jailed, Don Diego drops the masquerade, whips out his sword, wins over all the soldiers to his side, forces the governor to abdicate, and wins the hand of Lolita, who's ecstatic to discover that her weakling suitor, Diego, is actually the dashing hero she's in love with. In the final reel, some of the most jaw-dropping stunts this side of Jackie Chan occur in the movie. And it's the most amazing action set piece ever seen in a black and white movie, according to several historical reviewers. Now, a little bit of this Batman relationship. This is pre-automobile. There's like a bat cave underneath Diego's hacienda, a secret subterranean stable house for Zorro's black steed 
with a hidden shrub portal to the outside world. Sound familiar? Even the grandfather clock passageway from the house to the underground lair was copied by Batman. Douglas Fairbanks, the star of this feature, was born in 1883. His nickname became Everybody's Hero. Americans were so familiar with him between the period of World War I to the advent of sound films that they referred to him as Doug. His real name was Douglas Ullman. He came from a Jewish family. His dad was a lawyer, but sadly, his dad was also an alcoholic and an absent dad. The name Fairbanks helped him, the, the son, deflect the, ram the rampant anti-Semitism that was prevalent in America during this era. He made his debut on Broadway in 1902 referred to and described by critics as breezy, attractive, and appealing. His first film came out in 1915, and he burst into stardom. He was a comic, romantic hero. He had grand plans, though, wanted to work with huge budgets, thrilling stories, and he decided um, after his fame was growing that he would take a chance. And he connected up with actress Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, who he did marry a year or so later, and his good friend Charlie Chaplin to form a company called United Artists in 1919, where they would have control over the production and distribution of their own films. This was the most remarkable financial arrangement in American popular culture ever tried to this time period. The Mark of Zorro was the first film produced and distributed by United Artists. So 1920, this movie comes out and it's a bold new idea. The dual character thing of like Diego and Zorro was a common device at the time in other films where you'd have a romantic person and an amazing dashing hero um, and a listless world weary fop by day. Think Superman? So this fabulous alternation of romance and thrills really got going with this movie. And Zorro, well, Fairbanks said that the man that's out to do something has got to keep in high gear all the time. After The Mark of Zorro, there are other movies that you now have as a homework assignment to follow up and see some of the other gems from Fairbanks' career as an action hero. He did The Thief of Baghdad, Robin Hood, and The Three Musketeers, all are masterpieces of art direction. Unfortunately, sound coming into the movies put Doug out of sync. The slower, talkier films he was obliged to make didn't suit his unreflective, exuberant self. And the economic crash of 1929 and the beginning of the Depression was hard on audiences relating to his characters. They started preferring seeing professional gangsters um, rather than acrobatic whimsy. And, but Doug Fairbanks had made the 1920s much merrier. I'd like to talk for a second about our guest conductor for this project, Rick Benjamin, who has also been here once previously to work on a silent film with us. He's a genius when it comes to silent movies. He's a conductor, a historian, and an author. When he was a student at Juilliard in 1985, he rescued the lost library of the famous Victor Phonograph Company, almost 4,000 orchestral works by hundreds of American composers, which had been lost and are now found. He launched his career as the conductor of some of these works at the Lincoln Center and has become a strong and passionate advocate for America's original music especially that of silent films, early musical theater, and dance. He is the artistic director and pianist for the Paragon Ragtime Orchestra that has been doing this for over 35 years and won numerous awards with his orchestra, particularly working with silent films. He's an expert on film music and there's a wonderful DVD with his orchestra that is available for public consumption. And we each received a copy of the movie in our rehearsal folders, which was a really great way to help prepare listening to the score that we would be playing and watching the action, which 
frankly, when we're in rehearsals and at the actual performance, we don't really get ever get to see the movie. So this has been a super big treat to have the DVD. So thank you, Rick. The 1920 musical score has a kind of an interesting story. The original music that was used at the debut of the movie kind of disappeared pretty quickly after the premiere. And the, the music that you will hear if you can join us at the film on Saturday night is a, a compilation of classical music, which was standard at the time to do, like we use here in this film score, um, Bizet's Carmen, you'll be hearing excerpts if you're familiar with that opera, music by Granados, a very famous and popular Spanish composer and other classical pieces. It's glamorous and fun. So you're gonna be feeling and seeing what audiences in 1920 and in the next few years actually heard along with the movie when they saw it. The Anchorage Symphony, um, our traditional pattern to prepare for these events is we have three nights of rehearsals and then do the film for an audience. This was a pattern that was established by our beloved former music director, Randy Fleischer who established this annual silent movie tradition with our orchestra, which we have so enjoyed for the last um, 10 plus years. These aren't easy to do. And Randy always wittily described the Hollywood process with computers and effects and timing that were um, intricately involved with putting sound with film in contemporary movies. But then he would lift his baton and say, but I only have this and watching the movie to make the magic of the timing sound fitting the action. His job and Rick's job, as you will see um, for any conductor that works with live orchestras with silent movies is incredibly demanding in terms of that precise timing to make sure effects happen at the right time and the right music happens at the right time. There are cue sheets in segments in our scores to play the film. And um, as I mentioned, there's adaptations of classical music, but then there's also what is referred to as stock music, which was music that was found in libraries at theaters that would be used, oh, this one would sound pretty good at this spot in the movie, so we'll use this particular popular song or a bit of music that's been used for other films. So it's a combination of classical music and stock music in the theater. And for those of us who don't play in every number, like me, there's um, each is named by a number and a letter. So there might be score 4B, which leads to 4C, then you might rest till 6F or, I mean, so we're constantly focused on the conductor and the cueing and he or she is focused on the film and the score. So it's quite an intense process and the sweat will be rolling down all of us by the end of the movie. In closing, I wanted to mention a couple of cool facts. The Mark of Zorro was the movie that Bruce Wayne saw as a child with his parents the night that they were killed by a thug in the first Batman films. So that historical thing is kind of cool to know. And also it's interesting knowing that Douglas Fairbanks feared that the Mark of Zorro might not be accepted by audiences. This was a new idea, a costume adventure film. World War I had just ended two years earlier. The Spanish flu pandemic, which claimed millions of lives worldwide, was just now easing away. Sound familiar? This was, people were exhausted by tragedy. Audiences were ready then for a full dose of romance and the triumph of social justice delivered by a smiling Douglas Fairbanks who was athletic and joyful and exuberant and made everyone laugh. And heaven knows we all need that ourselves at this unsettled time. So stay safe. Enjoy The Mark of Zorro. Watch other Douglas Fairbanks movies if you're looking for a way to continue to feel uplifted in these dark winter evenings. And I hope we can be in person or live streaming again soon. January 22nd is our next Anchorage Symphony Classic Concert and it features an array of incredible music by American composers, especially of the beloved Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue featuring pianist Timothy Smith. So join us in person or live streaming and please, please stay safe. We're gonna get through this and the arts are just gonna keep 
growing and entertaining all of us and giving our hearts a lot of joy. Thank you. <laughs>